Okay, well, we're looking here, we're standing here at Tel Beersheba, which is the ancient city of Beersheba, going back at least as far as the times of the kings of Judah uh, in the Bible. And we have records in the Bible of events that took place here in Beersheba, and Josiah the king uh, wanted to bring the people back to the law of God and sent his servants out to destroy all of the false altars and other things that had been built up and they found one even here in Tel Beersheba. So Tel Beersheba goes back at least as we say to the uh, 600s BC and today it's in between the Negev Desert and the modern city of Beersheba which today has 200,000 people and they're planning on building it to 300,000 in the next couple of years. But Beersheba is where Abraham gave its name. Isaac confirmed it. The three patriarchs, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, lived here with their wives, and also Hagar and Ishmael lived here. But God, in opening up Beersheba and into his history of covenant with Israel, and through Israel to the rest of the world, Abraham named it. I, Isaac confirmed the name, and Beersheba has a checkered history in the early days, including from Beersheba they asked for a king like the Gentiles have, because the, king, the sons of Samuel were corrupt as they judged the people here in the area. But today God has brought Beersheba back into focus. He's put it back on the map of his redemption to bring his people back here to this land that he promised to give them for an inheritance and Beersheba was the, was the scene of a major surprise horse charge and victory by the Anzac, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps with the Australian Light Horse on October 31st, 1917 to capture Beersheba from the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, the Muslim Ottoman Turks who had been here for 400 years. And Beersheba was the only city they built in the 400 years that they were in Palestine. So Beersheba today, we're looking out towards the plains and the hills. There's a hill over there uh, beyond us that you can see with a couple of antenna towers. That's called Chauvel's Hill. Chauvel was the New Zealand commander of the Light Horse Forces. And he is the one who gave the command for those horses to charge. But before that could happen, which was on around the late afternoon of October 31st, 1917, before that could happen, there were more battles during that day earlier on, which made it possible in the cooperative effort of everyone putting in their part that made for this victory. In the morning hours, the British forces were further to the east and a bit north at what today is called Choquette Junction, which you, if you're traveling from Beersheba, if you get to Choquette Junction, you can go northward towards Hebron, Bethlehem, and Jerusalem, or you can go eastward towards Arad and the Dead Sea, or you can go westward towards Tel Aviv and the Mediterranean coast. So at that Choquette area, the British fought in the morning against the Turkish forces and more losses in combat occurred there by the British than the Australians and New Zealanders lost the rest of the day. So that morning battle though made it possible for the other events leading up to the exciting uh, charge of the light horse by the Australian uh, 12th light horse, light horse group brigade. Kelvin can put in the information. So. At noontime, we're standing at Tel Beersheba. This is an observation tower, which was not there then. We're standing on Tel Beersheba, which again was is, is a mound built up over centuries, different towns like what you can see the, the remains of now, different towns over the centuries being built up on top of one another, which is a Tel. Okay, so around uh, noontime or thereabouts, with the Turks on top of the mound, with the strategic outlook all around the plain to protect it and, uh, and the town from the enemies who were the British and the Australians and New Zealanders. 
under the, under the charge of General Allenby of England at that time. They needed to get the Turks off this mound, otherwise they could not get into Beersheba. This charge into Beersheba was a surprise attack rather than what they had led the Turks to believe, and the Germans, who were in Gaza, they led them to believe that this charge would be again into Gaza. The Allied, Allied forces had tried twice before to take Gaza from the Germans and did not. So they made it look like they would try again, but, but the reality was they needed the wells of the, with the water that were found in Beersheba. And so they were intent on getting Beersheba before dark in order to keep the element of surprise. It had to be done that day, October 31st. So around noontime or thereabouts, the Kiwis began to assault the mound. It, they were in a uh, hard situation. They were looking up and the Turks were looking down. And the mound isn't that large. It's hard to be hidden anywhere around it. It's all open space, even more so back then. But the Kiwis succeeded at some point to capture the mound and defeat the Turks here at Tel Beersheba, which made it possible then, after the British had fought earlier in the morning and kept those Turks away, after the Kiwis captured Tel Beersheba from the Turks again around the noontime or so, the way was paved to allow for the light horse or whoever else that Chauvel would have chosen to go in, to go in and make this charge and capture the city. Now this was a suicide mission to some extent, which I'm sure the, I believe that the Anzac forces would have felt. They had been in Gallipoli in Turkey in April of 1915, which for the Australians is their birth battle. And they lost big. It was a huge sacrifice. That was, that was uh, they were told to go fight when they really had no chance to win at the point of that command and they lost so many that they that is their sacrifice that they believe their nation really got built off from. I see, I see. So here again, two and a half years later, they're being told again, these brave horsemen and soldiers, okay, ride your horses in, you're not getting off, you're going all the way in and you're going to capture those wells. So they were totally open to the fire from the artillery, from the cannon, and then with bayonets and rifles, everybody in the trenches, the Turks were in their trenches. Of course, there could have been barbed wire along the way, any other kind of wire. They didn't really know fully what they might come into. They were told, you know, we have to go, we have to get this city. And uh, thank God, it was a really uh, brave charge, and God protected them. Not too many were actually killed relatively, and the horses as well, and they did capture the city, got the wells. Most of them, all but two, remained intact. They could get the water, control the area, which opened the way for then the British and the other, and the Anzac to go to capture Gaza this time successfully, then go to Jerusalem, and Allenby walked in on December, December 11th, I believe. Then they went up and captured Damascus even. The whole land of Palestine was taken by the British, and the British on the same day as October 31st battle, in the war cabinet in England, in London, decided that there would be a Balfour Declaration, which was the British saying they looked with favor and with good intention to help the Jewish people come back to this land of Israel and reestablish a homeland. Well, they didn't know then what was going on on the field here, and on the field here didn't know what was going on in the war cabinet in London at that time. I didn't know that. You know, there's no internet then, no yeah. cell phones, no this. But God was working in his over in the super supervision of history, we could say, and oh. and bringing about his word, and he's still bringing it about. It hasn't finished yet. But that the victory allowed the British to proclaim this Balfour Declaration 2 days later on November 2nd. Uh, which had there been not a victory here by the Allies, there would have been no Balfour Declaration to proclaim. So it really was dependent on this victory, which of course they weren't quite aware of. They were told to get to Jerusalem by Christmas. That's all they had known. That was the, uh, in the desire 
of the government and it, back in back in Britain, they wanted to capture Jerusalem by Christmas time, which they did. They got it on December 9th and 11th. Allenby walked in. So this battle here in Beersheba, though, broke the back of the Ottoman Empire here in Palestine. It broke the back of the Ottoman Empire itself. Because after that, with World War I coming to a close, then all the victorious powers decided how the Ottoman Empire would be would be divided up and who would get the spoils. And the British got Palestine, and the British mandate followed. And uh, they backed away from their intentions, good intentions that they had proclaimed with the Balfour Declaration, but God was going on. And this war over whose land it is and who is the God of the land is still being fought today. And we're looking forward to closure in the nearer future than what they knew back even uh, 70 years ago, 100 years ago, or even 4,000 years ago when Abraham uh, started his journey with, with, the, with, with the Lord.